Monday, May 20th, 1991 in Crawfordsville, Indiana, just three days after the city of Crawfordsville had uh, several tornadoes hit on the, north, on the west and north side of town, which did considerable damage. And we're just happy we have power to be able to, to do these interviews. Uh, this is another in a series of interviews with veterans of World War II. And uh, we've had uh, some real good interviews, and we know that today will be no exception. Uh, these uh, tapes, uh, interviews, really started uh, from an idea that we picked up off of watching the, the Civil War, uh, uh, stories about the Civil War that were on the PBS a few months ago. And uh, they were, uh, Ken Burns was the narrator and, and showed pictures of uh, people who 50 years ago uh, fought in the Battle of Gettysburg and had whiskers clear down to here. And uh, so far we haven't had any people who were in the World War II about 50 years ago that have long chin whiskers like that. Uh, these uh, uh, interviews will be placed in the library, their property of the Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, my name is Claire Chamberlain. Uh, I live here in Crawfordsville, uh, a member of the American Legion and the VFW. Our cameraman is Ed Miller, a member of the American Legion and the VFW. Uh, another gentleman who really started this whole idea to get this done, and we're glad he did, is Bob Wernley, semi-retired attorney uh, here in Crawfordsville. We've also had a lot of help uh, from uh, Mike Hall. Uh, we're taping from the Lane Place in Crawfordsville and Mike is the uh, is the executive uh, director so to speak or manager here at the Lane Place. Uh, today uh, we'll now start our interview and if I could sir, what is your name? William Morgan. They call me Woody. They call you Woody. Right. I see. I got that from a baseball player the Chicago Cubs. Oh, okay. well, he was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where were you born, Woody? I was born in Wayland. I was born uh, uh, November the 1st, 1918. Oh, I see. And my mother related the story to me that I was one of nine babies that week in Montgomery County, and I was the only one to survive because of the flu epidemic. Oh, I see. And uh, in fact, I did live at home for 30 days. An old lady, neighbor lady took me and kept it for 30 days. Because my mother had to live when I was born. So consequently, uh, I had to start two homes. <laughs> yeah. Who were your parents? Uh, Stanley and Morgan and uh, Stella Morgan. They was, Stanley was originally from Hart County. My mother was from Wayland. Mm -hmm. What was her maiden name? Scott. Uh, she was... Uh, See, her father fought in the Civil War, oh, yeah. and he came uh, home from the war when his buddy got killed, and his buddy told him before he died that he said, when you go home, take care of my wife Mary, which later became my grandmother, and he mm -hmm. did be married her, and, and uh, that's kind of ironic, you know, that, that he would, he, his wife died after he got home, and then he married my grandmother. So. You know, it is ironic. Yeah. Do you have brothers and sisters? Oh yes, there was 12 in our family. Oh my goodness. <laughs> there was uh, eight boys and four girls. Mm -hmm. Where did, where were you in the line of? I was seventh child. Seventh child. I guess that has to be considered lucky. No, I said seven. Right. <laughs> uh, where did you go to school? I went to school at Wayland, Wayland High School. Then I got transferred to Brazil in the last couple of years. And uh, they down there until Later on, we lived up on a farm by Hillsborough, and uh, they closed the mine down because of a strike, and I went to the coal mine, which is an experience I'm glad I had. I know how coal miners had to live. Yeah. <laughs> they all mine coal all week and go to town and drink beer on Saturday night and tell about how much coal they mined that weekend. Right. <laughs> uh, after school, did you graduate from high school? No, I just withdrew. I, I was due. I had to, because of the economic situation, mm -hmm. I just could not go away, but I had to go to work. Where'd you go to work? In the coal mines. Mm -hmm. I lived in Brazil at that time. I see. In the coal mines. Then um, what'd you do? Well, then I worked at Turkey Run State Park in the hotel for four years after that. And 
I go a taxi here in Carbondale in the wintertime when I get laid off. About what year would this be, Woody? Uh, 1937 through 1941. Okay. Uh, till September 41 when I went into service. So I worked for four years in the summertime from about April till about 1st of November, and then I would um, come back to Carbondale. I'd go to a cab for the Yellow Cab Company in the wintertime. They give much money, a dollar a day, seven days a week. That'd go a long way, but uh, it, it, I survived. That's all you had to do then was survive. Right. When did you have uh, ideas about going in the military? <clears throat> While I was at Turkey Run, there was three of us that decided we was going to visit a friend of ours that had been drafted from Turkey Run. He was in the Army, and we went down to see him at Cap Lee, Virginia. And uh, when I went in down there, I was so depressed from seeing what was going on around it. It was depressing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, this friend of ours, when he saw us come to visit him, he just broke down and cried. He's, he was so happy to see it. Mm -hmm. And when I left, I went into service September the 16th. This was the first week in September. Now, I knew that 1941. I 41. I knew that I was not going in the Army. Nothing. I mean, it just depressed me to see what I saw. And I always wanted to win the Navy anyway because it was a fellow from uh, Wayland, uh, Raymond Hanna, had gone into the Navy and he used to talk to me about it. That excited me when I was a kid and sat on the streets. In fact, he was lost overboard down around Cuba someplace. Hmm. And uh, so I decided when I come back, I was going to go into the Navy. And I went to Terry Holt to enlist down there because I was a turkey run. They didn't have a Navy recruiting office here. So, they took me in, and on the 16th of September, I enlisted, and they sent me to Great Lakes Naval Training Station. At that time, they only had 6,000 people there on, in, the, in the camp, Camp Mary. And before the war was over, they had 150,000. So, right. so <laughs> it grew quite a lot while I was in. So then I went to school in Connecticut after. Let's go back to boot camp a little bit. What did you do in boot camp? Well, I almost got killed there. The guy was taking these heavy lines and practicing throwing them, and he just missed my head just about that much. I could hear the wind off of it when it went by. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a lot of training and drilling and marching. Disciplinary work was mm -hmm. absolutely, it was uh, one way to get discipline. Because if you didn't do it right, you had to get out and march and run around the field. And I know, for instance, one time, I, the guy didn't salute the flag when they, uh, in the evening. And I saw this old chief have him out here just running him back and forth until he finally dropped. He couldn't run no more. But uh, I felt that was a little bit harsh, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I felt it, but mm -hmm. I wasn't involved in it. <laughs> yeah. When did you leave Great Lakes then? Uh, let's see, we left. Uh, the reason I remember when we left, I was sitting, told to go to school in Connecticut. As ships, the cooks and bakers school in Connecticut in the Roten Heights. And uh, my brother's birthday was on the 3rd, and we got there on the 3rd. That's the reason why I remember December the 3rd before Pearl Harbor on December the 7th. And I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was, you know. I was just new in the Navy and had been around. But an old chief told me where it was. It was in Honolulu. And, uh, I was pretty well sad with all the casualties we had. Mm -hmm. One reason I went to, in boot camp, I was with uh, a young fellow. He told me his brother was stationed aboard the USS Shaw in Pearl Harbor. And the brothers can go to, together at that time. And so he uh, put in, he joined his brother, which he did. And I always wondered, he had just about had time to get there, if he did get there. I never saw him again. And I happened to uh, know a fella that was on the USS Shaw that was stationed with me at Floyd Bennett Field. <laughs> and I asked him if he knew this kid. And he said he didn't know. He said we had so many casualties. I didn't. He said if he was just new aboard ship, I wouldn't have known him. Mm -hmm. So I, never, I always wondered what ever happened to him, but I never saw him anymore. I see. So, okay, you're in Connecticut at Cook and Baker School. Cook and Baker School. How did they happen to select you to be a Cook and Baker? I think because I worked at Turkey Run and done a little cooking down there and busboy work and uh, worked around 
food and they thought I'd be a good cook. <laughs> but I come out all right. In the end, I was the chief commissary steward. Four was all over. Not at that school, but yeah. before the end of my How long were you in the uh, cook and baker school? I was there from December the 3rd till March, uh, the middle of March, I think it was. It was in March. Mm -hmm. What did you do in that school? Just practice oh, cooking? We, yeah, we, we, we took training in how to cook. They had old time chiefs and knew how to cook and taught us. And, and we do different things. Do a little baking, a little cooking, and butchering. And mm -hmm. I think it was about three months. Yeah, let's see, December, January, February. Three, about three and a half months. Okay. Then where did you go? Then I went to, uh, they sent us down to Floyd Bennett Field. And uh, I know they sent us to New York for for uh, reassignment out of New York, Third Naval District. We got down there, and they said they needed two two to go uh, to Floyd Benfield. Well, we knew where it was because we had gone down to New York a lot. We knew where Floyd Benfield was, and uh, so when we said we two of me, Dale Kennedy, buddy, Mike, which I still correspond with. Good. That's 50 years ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, so they sent us to Floyd Benefield, and they hadn't even completed the place that they could pump the sand in out of the ocean to make railways. Mm -hmm. And we stayed in the Marine Barracks and for a while. Then we stayed in the hangar. Then they finally built barracks for the ship's crew to, to uh, sleep in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there almost three years. And yeah, is that right? Yeah. And uh, we had a we had a zone, this airfield, Florida Naval Air Station had a 500-mile zone that they covered. And they flew all the time because as a cook, I used to have fixed flight rations for the crews to go out and fly all around the clock. Crews would come in here and get their food for whatever it was going to be out, seven, eight hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, we flew over this 500-mile uh, zone looking for submarines, and which the, uh, the Germans had a lot of submarines at that time. I mean, they just knocking our shipping off, something terrible. Just our fleet was really losing an awful lot of transport ships and food ships and cargo ships. Did you ever go up in plane? Uh, no, I wasn't allowed to go up unless the pilot wanted to take me up, and I had offers to go, but I, mm -hmm. I said, no, thank you, I'll stay on the ground. Okay. But, uh, but I really enjoyed it there because it was uh, it wasn't as strict discipline there as it was on other places, the Navy, the bases, Army bases, and so on. Due to the fact that the pilots' life and their ships depended upon the crews that uh, maintained them and took care of them, and so on. they was gassed up and it was functioning perfect. Mm -hmm. And they had to check off lists where they check everything off, what they had to do to each man, and then they'd go over them list before they let the plane go out to see if they was proper. What kind of planes were these that did this patrolling? F, let's see, we had F-4Us mostly. I don't know. I think that's, uh, we had a lot of F-4Us at that time. That plane. was a fighter plane? Yeah, they were fighter planes. And they would uh, go out. They had a lot of stamina. They could drop, uh, they could drop uh, bombs on the submarines. Did they? Yeah. Oh, we sank a lot of subs, the German, German subs uh, from our base. That was one way we, we helped clean them out, you know. Mm -hmm. There were other airfields from Norfolk and Jacksonville and Florida and up Boston, you know, that had their zone to cover. We only had 500 miles, which sounds like a lot, but it's not very, mm -hmm. it really isn't that much. Yeah. If they hit a, a, a sub, uh, did they ever, did you know of a ship ever going out then and picking up prisoners? No, they never bothered to they, 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 they sunk them. They sunk them and that's it. They never bothered to anything else. They just knew that they sunk them. I understand they told me the higher they were, they flew, they could see further down in the water. That was the reason why they used airplanes instead of submarine searches. They had some of them, but not too many. The planes did the damage. Did you get to know some of the pilots? Oh yeah, yeah I did. What did you think of them? Oh, I loved them. They were, they were just great guys. You know, I mean, they just 
they didn't seem like an army officer, even though they had their ratings and everything. But they were just they were army officers. No, oh, navy officers. They were navy officers. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they had their everything from ensign to captain. You know. Mm -hmm. But the, the pilots, most of them were lieutenants, lieutenant JGs, and mm -hmm. they uh, they were just uh, they were just nice people. I know one night. I hate to say this, but I was over at a bar. You know, that's what I say was well. I've been in a couple. And they had this big oval bar. Right across the on the other side, there's two officers sitting there drinking beer one night. And all at once I heard a gun go off. And I didn't know what it was. And all at once I saw this guy slump off of the this officer slump off of the uh, chair and uh, he fell on the ground. He was on the floor and he was dead. But I never knew whether he accidentally did it or, or what happened. Nobody knew. All of them, I mean, I saw them talking, you know, like two guys. Could, but they had their uh, weapons with them. Why, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But they had gone off duty mm -hmm. and went in there to drink. Might have gotten an argument. They didn't seem to be. One of the SPs didn't come from all directions. Oh, they did. And they shut the bar up right there. They made everybody leave and get out and inspect it. And I. I didn't see anything wrong, you know. One guy said, well, maybe he committed suicide, but I doubt it. He just didn't seem like that kind of a person. Of course, you never know. But you never heard what was well, They really never wrong. give no report on it. Okay. Very interesting. Is there anything else you want to tell us about your duty at Floyd Benton Field? Anything well, spectacular, like... Uh, uh, used Any to, famous people that came through there, or uh, they used to come out uh, the uh, baseball teams in spring training when they come back to Florida would come out and play Floyd Benfield's baseball team, and uh, I saw we had to cook a meal for them: steaks, mm -hmm. French fries, salads for the uh, all the Giants players there. I think it was two years in a row, 42, 43. Mm -hmm. oh, so I got to see the old players like Mel Watt and different. Oh, did you? People would know who Mel Watt was, but the rest sure. of the Giants probably they wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was exciting and interesting. Okay. Well, where did you go from Floyd Bennett Field then? Well, okay. I went down to Norfolk, Virginia to, uh, for reassignment. And they already had me picked to go on this destroyer mine layer. And when I went to, uh, aboard that ship, it was, we were out down there all, all summer in Norfolk, and I hated that place. Mm -hmm. uh, I can honestly say they said that on the average of a suicide a week on, on the Navy base there, it was that bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just, I never even went in town here one time, and I, and I stayed on the base mm -hmm. for my entertainment, whatever it was. And, uh, I was always in trouble with somebody. Mm -hmm. I, you're supposed to have your pants legs down, you know. And I, mm -hmm. and we'd go chow, I'd roll them up so the rain would splatter on them. And I would have run into the commander of the base. And he sure, he walked up and tapped me on the shoulder. Sailor, roll your pants legs down. And that's all. And then later on, I saw him over the mess hall. They had this mess hall where everybody went over and ate lunch and and so I said to these guys I was with, I said they had a whole big, several chairs, all tables all lined up for the officers. I said, there's nobody here. They never come in here. I said, let's just sit here. We didn't have any place else to sit, but we hadn't any more guys sit down. There come the commanding officer and the whole crew and their wives and everybody through there. He walked up to me and he said, you again? And I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, well, he said, go ahead and finish your snack here, and then don't get in here anymore. He said, don't, I don't want to ever see you in there again. <laughs> but I couldn't get away from him. He, he, he was always around me for some reason, or other, and I don't know why I think it was that way. <laughs> OK. Keep but, talking. Tell us more about your, your ship now. Oh, well, I went aboard this. Uh, Destroyer mine layer. They sent us up to New York to get Brooklyn Navy Yard to go aboard this. A whole new crew. We went down there for training. Well. Was it a new ship too? Yeah, it was a new one. It's this Destroyer mine layer. Mm -hmm. They only had eleven of them in the whole service in the Navy. And I went on this one. 
Uh, I went, we, we went aboard the naval, uh, this ship here, and then we went on a shakedown cruise. Mm -hmm. And we went down to Bermuda for that. Mm -hmm. While we were down there, I remember one thing very distinctly. We lost two men overboard. The water was awful rough down there in Cape Hatteras. Mm -hmm. That's where we were. And uh, so I saw these guys. I went out to take some bait crates out on the deck and set them out there after a drill we had. We just had a drill, general quarter drill. And I was, I was a cook and all these late crates and everything is in the way. So I just went out and sat on the deck. I was going to have the rest cook taking us to the back of the ship where we put all of our stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, back on the fan tail. So that little ship started going down right when I turned around. Started going down, down, down. I reached in there and I grabbed a hold of a, a railing. Mm -hmm. And the water was up around my knee. And I looked around and there was those, those uh, egg crates and all that stuff floating out to sea. Mm -hmm. And I looked up and I saw somebody going by. You know, I said, My God, that's somebody got washed overboard. And uh, so I didn't have my life jacket on. But that's the last time I ever went on deck without my life jacket. I could just see me out there. Well, these two guys, chief gunner's mate, and another one of his assistants was forced overboard, and we searched for hours for him, and we never did find him. So finally, another ship picked him up late that afternoon. They could see him. They just had to come right up on him a little bit. They small. did save him. Yeah, they saved him. And uh, one guy had just been married two weeks, and I talked to him when he came back aboard. He. Uh, he told me that he took he had one of these life jackets on, you blow up. And he said, I took my shoes off and fell, fell off these man of wars. There was, uh, there was time to attack me. Mm -hmm. And he said, I looked over and there was a chief over there. He, he had a May West life jacket, life jacket on him. And he was injured. He said, and I went over and helped him and stayed with him until we were picked up by some landing craft was down there on the and That's where we were. So they finally got him, and they, I never saw him anymore until I went on the USS Bountiful. I was in a bar one night, and here he come in, this chief. I hadn't seen him since. I said, where you been? You left the ship a long time, didn't you? He said, oh, he said, that was a terrible experience for me. Oh, that it was. He said, my shoulder was broken. He mm -hmm. said, I was in the hospital for a long time with that. And uh, this other kid, he, he'd only been married two weeks before we went on the ship down. He was happy to be back aboard. Yeah. What was the name of your ship? The J. William Ditter. It was uh, named Ditter. Ditter, D-I-T-T-E-R. Okay. It was uh, named after a senator from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. so I don't know why I remember that, but how big was it? it how was, many men, for example, did you have? We had about uh, 300 men and 20 officers. So mm -hmm. we had a complement of 320 all together, mm -hmm. and it was. Three feet wide, it was only, I think about 300 feet long, or something like that. Yeah, it was it was good. Good. what was the armament on it? We had, uh, we had on the front of the ship, out on the bow, we had two 5 inch gun mounts, and, uh, and then we had our four 40 millimeter twin that I was on millimeter at the side, and then we had a few 50 caliber, and then we had twin. Uh, 41 millimeters on the fan tail. And I think we had one five inch gun back there, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And then the mine tracks is all we had. Mm -hmm. We didn't have too much firepower, but we had quite a lot. And that, when we went to Okinawa, they decided to put us out on radar picket duty. That was the intercept yeah. all the planes up there. Okay, you're still now at uh, New York or Norfolk? Norfolk. Okay. And when did you leave Norfolk? Uh, let's see, I think it was, it was in late November, or of, we went back to New York. No, 1940. We went, we went back to Norfolk. I went to ship, we went back to Norfolk. That was 1944. <coughs> All right. No. But that time it was 45 because we sailed and went to Sydney right after that. So we got out there in 45, but this was in 40, early 45. And when we left to go to the Pacific, 
we ended up in the canal. Mm -hmm. What did you think of that? That was a wonderful experience. Tell us about it. Well, the one thing I remember most was I had no idea what the canal looked like. And I didn't know it was kind of a river that went all the way through after you got through the blocks. And uh, it, uh, the one thing I remember was I saw an old black lady in a little old boat, just, oh, it looked like it maybe about 10 feet long. And she had oars and she had full bananas. I don't know where she got them. I suppose they're in the jungle somewhere. <laughs> And she thought we'd gone ahead and she was just a roar, just as yeah. she could go get away from us. And then it was hot. Oh, it was hot. And uh, Panama was, was dirty. It, like all the countries down in there. It was just, I wouldn't use anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the trip through was nice, but I was glad it was over. And I've never been back since. Yeah. And uh, then we went around to the canal. And then where'd you go? To San Diego. I really remember pulling in San Diego, and the weather was, it was cold when we left, about 15 above zero and six inches of snow in Norfolk. We got around there and it was, uh, they had uh, uh, newspapers out on the docks, and I went out and got one and come back and sit down on the mine track to mm -hmm. read the newspapers. I opened it up and it said, Midwest hit with blizzard. And it's telling about how deep the snow was and how bad it was here. I'm sitting there in a skimmy shirt, read the paper, it didn't seem possible. <laughs> but I, I like How it. long did you stay in San Diego? We weren't there but about uh, four or five days, and then we took off and, and we got supplies and kind of relaxed a little. Then you headed for Okinawa? No, we went to Hawaii. Okay. And we was there. Three or four days. We took us about five days to get out to Hawaii, and and we had uh, that was where we had our uh, camouflage painted on our ship in Hawaii. I don't know why, but it took a long time. Mm -hmm. And then we went from there to the end of We Talk. And the thing that I remember going to the end of We Talk was we was I was out on the deck one day up at my gun. That's where I usually spent all my time off. And uh, so I was there at the, uh, sitting there looking out, and all at once I saw a submarine come up. We was escorting an aircraft carrier to Anna We Do you know which one it was? I can't remember which one it was. Okay. It's just because we escorted so many of them. You know? mm -hmm. And while we was there, I, could, I saw a submarine come up, and I couldn't believe it. You know, first time I'd ever seen a real live a Japanese submarine. <laughs> So I said to the governor, I said, hey, look at that, there's a submarine. Is, is that a submarine? He said, yeah. And he hollered at the, at the governor officer on the, on the telephone, on the earphones, and, and told him. And all at once again, general quarters went off, and that old aircraft carrier took off. And the other destroyer on the other side, there was two destroyers escorting them. They fell back right behind us, between us and the aircraft carrier, and they took off. And uh, then we had orders to uh, search out and destroy the submarine, which we did. We dropped, I think it's 40 depth charges in that one area, finally, the old oil and everything started coming up. And we got credit for that submarine. And then we was to meet the ship, the enemy ships the next day in a certain area, certain place, and we did. Of course, you know, they have ways of, you, you go sail in a certain spot and everybody's there that wants to be. So we continued to escort the ship on the end of Weetop. And uh, we went, that's just a small island you can see right over it. Mm -hmm. And all the crew that supplied us with fuel, we, we refueled there. And they were, looked like they'd been there, I think, maybe about 18 months. Mm -hmm. They would really look the, look the part. Mm -hmm. and, uh, was glad to see somebody, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we stayed there and we talk. Then they sent us down to the equator, but we didn't get to cross it. We was 30 miles from the equator, but the captain, he said, I don't want to fool with that stuff now. You guys celebrate you know, killing each other. You're right. So he went across it. So we went from there to uh, Ulithi. I don't know if you ever heard of that or not, but 
it was what they called the West, uh, Pearl Harbor of the Western Pacific. Okay. And I was in there one day, and I saw my brother's ship come in there all at once. He heard his ship come in. I knew what his USS Irwin he was on. Mm -hmm. So I talked to uh, to my uh, commanding officer and supply officer first. One I wanted to see a captain. He said, "Okay." I told him my brother's ship come in. I wonder if I can get a boat to go over and see him. Yeah, he said, you might as well. Good. I said, we're not going to be here long anyway. <laughs> so I went aboard his ship. And uh, so he, I told him I didn't know where we were going, and I did. So eventually, I came back to my ship, and then we sailed for Okinawa. I had never heard of Okinawa before. Mm -hmm. The Ryuki Islands. And, uh, it was, they, it was about 100, mm -hmm. no, almost 300 miles south of Japan. Didn't you run into some testing of um, weapons uh, somewhere along the line? Atomic? Well, uh, we didn't test any. I thought you mentioned about seeing an atomic bomb test. Oh, that was after the war was over. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm getting ahead of you. Yeah. All right. Go ahead then. Please. So we went up to. Uh, we sailed for Okinawa, and they called us down in the mess hall and briefed us on everything, the types of diseases and where we were going, and they had a big map and showed us where we would be, and then we would be cleaning out all the mines so they could have the invasion there. So, cause ironic, I'd been down in the gun map, uh, in the gun map, I'd been in the magazine. Uh, that was my battle station. Mm -hmm. and ammunition, 40 millimeter shells up to the deck to the second loader, and then he'd hand them to the first loader, and they dropped in the guns. So uh, I was usually up on the, in the gun mount quite a lot. The officer, gunner officer was always on to me about it. He said, you're supposed to be down there. I said, well, I know what to do down there. I want to see what's going on up there. Yeah. So he, uh, anyway, we went to Okinawa. About a day before we got in there, we was uh, practicing or elevating our guns and everything. And this one kid from Indianapolis, uh, he was, uh, I can't think of his name now, anyway, he was asleep. First gunner, first gunner, he was asleep. And uh, they elevated the gun and come down and he had his leg there and it mashed his knee. Mm. So he was unable to perform. Mm -hmm. So they was talking about uh, about uh, replacing him, and who they were going to get to replace him. And I heard that supply officer say, send Morgan up there. He knows as much as anybody does. Said he's up there all the time anyway. <laughs> but I was glad to get up there because I couldn't stand all that fire. And when I was all enclosed, and yeah. you couldn't see what was going on. And up there, I could see what was going on. Mm -hmm. So they put him down there in the passageway, in the, in the um, uh, in that hospital bunk, what we call it. It was just regular old Navy bunks, so they just used it for uh -huh. for the sick to lay in. Uh -huh. And uh, so I took his place. And the next day we got into Okinawa, and we got under a real heavy air attack. Kamikaze suicide plane was coming in. I had never seen one before, but I sure did there. Uh -huh. And in fact, they had a plane bomber from Japan. It was or one of our bombers. It was uh, he must have been crippled because he was trying to get into Okinawa to land. What he was trying to do, and we was shooting at him, and and he dipped his wings, you know, back and forth, trying to let us know that his friendly plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, so finally, he landed over there someplace. I never heard of him or anything about him again. But I know the captain gave us 36 hours recognition training after that, so we would know when we were shooting on our planes. But he shouldn't have been in there. Mm -hmm. Really, he had no business in there. And uh, so that was the first day we had a, I saw many planes being shot down. And some of them would dive on us. They'd go right down in the water and miss us. And you never see them again. They just kill them on the And uh, some of them would hit the water and bounce way up in the air. And mm -hmm. Of course, the ones we hit would always explode. You know. Did your ship get credit for hitting some of these planes? Oh, yes. How many? Had, uh, I think we wound up hitting uh, 26 planes all together in the three months we were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, 
we weren't there. Uh, I think it was 26 planes and one submarine, and then little mini subs they had there in the hand. Okay, we got. Oh, what date are we talking about? We're you? talking the the invasion. We went up there in March the 26th to sweep the mine, uh, 45 to uh, sweep these mines, and then we. Uh, April 1st was the invasion day, and that's when it really broke loose all the firepower. You never saw nothing like it. We had 1,500 ships there, and I think they all unloaded on, on that. So, on the island, well, we didn't have any casualties the first three days, because I knew they would. On your ship? Uh, no, on, on the beach. I see. Because well, they landed on there, and we, they went in free. They didn't have. We cleaned that beachhead out really good. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's a funny thing. I could, we could sail there by, by being on the mine server. We had to go right up as close as we could get to the shore mm -hmm. and get the mines that they had. Did you there. get mines? Oh, yeah. We used to blow them up. And How did you blow them up? With our 40 millimeter gun rounds. I mean, with our 40 millimeter. In other words, you visually yeah. spotted them? Yeah. And then we you shot, shot them. them. You hit a horn and the mine server would sweep them. And they come to the surface. How did sweep them? What, what, what mechanism would? They had a big arm uh, on the side of it that you could go so deep, and they just go in strips like a lawnmower. If you put them over a yard, you just go so many strips. They go about 20 feet. Then another mine sweeper right behind them would go, and these the uh, mines would come up, and then we'd shoot at them. Well, why wouldn't this this arm? Why wouldn't that? All that did is Why cable. wouldn't that well, ignite? It could, but it didn't. It, all I was interested in was cutting the cable that held it. Oh, it cut the cable. It cut the cable. That's all it was. They hold these mines under the water on cables. We cut the cables and they float to the top. I see. Okay. So then they would just be laying out there and they had to be destroyed. So these are forty millimeter guns. Mm -hmm. To to last time we couldn't get all of them. We'd have to leave them there all night. And go back the next day and get them. And we'd go over, go over what they call the Karama Red Islands, about 15 miles in there. There was a big bunch of creek island there, like a horseshoe cave, only it was open on both ends. You could go play a few. Was this in Buckner Bay? No, this was 15 miles away from there. Cause oh. We had to get out there at night because those planes had come in there and, and get us out there. You know, it was all full. Of, we, could, we couldn't operate in where the minefield was. Because they'd be floating around, we'd hit them. Yeah. So we withdrew and go to these to uh, Cromerell Islands, 15 miles away, and we had little boats. Each ship would have boats, and they'd get out and make smoke and cover you over with smoke, so that the suicide planes couldn't see you. They knew we were in there, and they'd get in low and fly down. You could hear them come by, you know. Mm -hmm. They'd fly in there trying to hit somebody, but. Uh, we, we'd stay there all night, and then we'd go back the next day and finish the blowing up the mines that we left. And that was a long procedure, yeah. over a week of it. Did you see the landing craft go ashore with the Marines and the Oh, no. We were right in, right in. Right what was happening? What? Tell us about that. Well, uh, they usually had landing craft ships, you know, these, they would, uh, my goodness. Thousands of, you know, of troops, but they had hundreds of the ships would carry them in so they could land. And uh, they they went in. They really didn't have any casualties for three days. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. because we had cleaned out the all the gun emplacements and run all the jacks out there off of the beach. They had over two million caves on that island, and they go back into their caves and stay there. Consequently, they had a pretty easy landing as far as casualties. There were none. But three days later, they started piling up. You know, they come out in caves and mm -hmm. start attacking our troops. Mm -hmm. And uh, three days later, what were you doing? We was out on radar picket duty. They sent us out to intercept suicide planes coming down from Japan, <laughs> and that was a tough job. Tell us about it. Well, we was out there by ourselves. And maybe six. You mean the only ship out there? There'd be other ones, but they wouldn't be within four or five miles of us. You know, we we had a certain zone we had to cover, and uh, yeah, we were 
the guys said, man, we were the 87th destroyer to get in. That uh, they sent little survivor boats out with us to pick up, you know, sailors that got blown overboard or wounded. And, uh, On other ships as well as your own. Yeah, yeah. So we had a quite a an ordeal there. One day they used over. The only time that I can remember they used so many planes, they used about 700 of them, and they they just they used 700. Yeah, you're talking about the Japs. Yeah, 700 planes, suicide planes, all together during the whole battle. Uh, Okinawa for about three months they used they used over 2,200 planes and they lost that many. Mm -hmm. What what they didn't we didn't get shoot down they hit us. But this one ship I remember I can't think of the name I already got hit so bad that from the water level deck first deck there was nothing left above nothing. Right. Was, I think they only had eight men to survive. We went alongside the. Uh, to try to see if we could do anything. Nothing we could do. They were all gone. Mm -hmm. And they took the, we didn't take them off, but another ship came by and took them to, to another, I don't know, reassigned them someplace and took them off the ship and they just towed that old ship in, in Buckley Bay, I think. Mm -hmm. There was nothing left of it. And they, uh, but let's say they used over 2,000 suicide planes. The greatest naval and sea air battle that ever existed right. in the history of the Navy. And we lost over 300 ships that was either hit, damaged, or sunk. Mm -hmm. And we were the 87th destroyer. So we had, we had a lot of casualties 5,000 injured and 5,000 killed. Mm -hmm. And I believe the count of Army and, and Marines was 100,000 mm -hmm. casualties. But we had 10,000, and that's a lot of. Navy personnel. Yes, it is. Yeah. And uh, that's even more than Pearl Harbor. <laughs> well, uh, two things. Tell us, uh, seeing a kamikaze hit a ship near you, and mm -hmm. then tell us about the one that hit you. Okay. Uh, we were out there, we had an air attack one day, and these planes was coming in, and I watched two of these. I didn't know what they were doing. We had a ship that was hit. And he was, uh, they dry docked him over there on the beach. They just beached it because it was totally destroyed almost. So these planes came over and they dived into that ship and there was nobody on it. They had taken all the personnel off and put them on other ships and stations, you know. And I thought that was, I got a kick out of that. Everybody just cheered, you know. Yeah. And yet that ship was already, had been hit. Uh -huh. so, but I, I did see one thing, they had a lot of inexperienced pilots, young, 15, 16, 17 year old boys that just learned how to fly, get the plane in the air and bring it in and attack. And, that's, mm -hmm. and they did some foolish flying, mm -hmm. really they did. And they hit a lot of ships, but they lost a lot of planes. Mm -hmm. They lost every one they sent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to tell you about this one plane we shot down one time, it's late in the evening, it's almost dark, and we shot him down, and so we went over, we saw he didn't sink, so we went over alongside of him, and there was, they had two pilots in this plane, they were what they called the Betty planes, why they had them, I don't know, but they had two men crew. And one was out on the tail of the ship, and one was out in front, and they had a little lights flashing, because it was almost dark, wanting to surrender. So, Captain would take him. He gave us orders to go out 40 and 41 to destroy the target. And I felt bad about that. I really did. I thought, you know, they're wanting to surrender. But the captain wasn't about to take him. And so we, we sank him. And they went down. I don't know what ever happened to him, but I would never saw him anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was going to tell you one little. One little incident, my brother told me when his ship, the USS Irwin, had shot down a plane, and there was two of them, and the one of them came over to surrender, and the other one went and jumped on his back and stabbed him to death, and then swam away. He wouldn't surrender, and he wouldn't go let his buddy surrender. Mm -hmm. He was telling me that. Well, that's why the, the captain gave the orders. Oh, he said, you never know. You never know. No. And he was right. 
I mean, I felt bad about it. Why wouldn't you feel bad? You know, you've been sure. have to kill somebody that that you you just you, it just didn't seem right to me. It was trying to surrender, and I hadn't experienced anything like that. But my buddy that was on his hospital ship with me, he was there on the beach at Okinawa, and he told me those uh, uh, Marines used to capture capture these. They'd go in and interrogate them. And then the commanding officer said, we'll take them down to the brig. Well, there was no brig. They'd take them down, march them down, and they'd make them squat down and, and they'd treat them, and they'd shoot them. Mm -hmm. Shoot them in the guts. Mm -hmm. Watch your guts roll out. Mm -hmm. This is this happened. Yeah. And he, he said, uh, I said, well, how did you get away with it? And he said, well, uh, they just said that uh, they tried to escape. And there were no more questions asked. This went on, but they did our troops the same way. They did our troops yes, here. They sure did. You couldn't trust them. No. So, anyway, the old captain called us up, and uh, we remarked about how bad it was. We thought it was, and he called us up at his office the next morning, and he said that in his stateroom, and he said, "I understand you boys are a little unhappy about me having them jets destroyed in that plane last night." I said, yeah, I, I just didn't feel right about it. And he said, well, don't worry about it. He said, well, if they come aboard and start throwing hand grenades and killing you or some of your buddies, which they probably would do, he said, I've been out here a long time in the Pacific, and I don't take no prisoners. So, uh, which, <laughs> just got another little story to relate to there. They had all these little suicide boats, you know, one-man crew. And they had them back in these caves. And I saw there one morning, it was almost daybreak, that's when they would attack you, so they could see you, but you couldn't see them very good. Coming out here on this mine track, and this guy jumping in there. And I told the gun girl, I said, hey, they're jumping in one of those suicide planes, or boats, not plane. And he said, well, we'll give you. So he, he said, we've got to wait until he gets out here first. So he came out right at us. And we started shooting at him. Well, he turned and tried to run away from us. And then another destroyer on our port side, one on the starboard side, they went up along the side, and we was right in the sand of shooting, shooting at him. Finally, we hit, hit the boat, and it knocked him out of the water and stunned him. He didn't know what happened, I guess. So we picked him up, and uh, our captain radioed over to the, to the ship, the, the oh, or I forget the name of the ship, gives the orders, flagship. 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 Yeah, flagship. Said, we've got a Japanese officer over here. What do you want us to do, kill him? And the officer said, no, we want to interrogate him. He said, if he's able to. So he said, we'll send a boat over after him. So we sent a boat from the army over there to get him. They took him. I don't know where he took him, but he's got into the army hands after that. And uh, he, uh, I don't know what ever happened to it, you know. But, but they had a lot of them. They had a lot of them little suicide boats. And uh, we got that suicide submarine, one man submarine. We got a couple of them mm -hmm. while I was in there. But uh, every day there was action. Every hour. Uh, it sounds like it. Well, tell us about when you got hit, Woody. Oh, okay. It was just about supper time. And <coughs> We chowed down supper, got everything out on the mess hall, and some of the guys had just cut their trays full and started eating when they had an air attack. So they had to leave it and go to the um, go to the uh, general quarter station. So that's when I went up to my station, and and anyway, we shot down. This one we hit this uh, here. He he comes through there and hit this. There's two stacks, and one's just like it, about 20 feet away. Let's get these and hold them out. Uh, if you can look upside down there, Woody, uh, to yeah. our cameraman, oh, yeah. and keep kind of keep them off the side so your fingers aren't on it, and, and, as you described them. Are you picking them up, uh, Ed? I had more pictures, but I do not know where they are. I had some good ones, showed the 52-foot hole. And, 
Now tell us what we're seeing. Well, here is where a plane hit there. There was a guy in that post there, and he jumped overboard there, all the way down on the deck, to keep from getting hit. And uh, the plane went out in the water. That's the only damage this would be. In. And I'm only just about 20 feet away from this other stack. And I really got scared then. I, I knew he'd come about as close as he could go. So, uh, anyway. Now, is that the main one that hit your ship? No, this is not the okay. main one. Let me see here just a minute. The main one hit our ship, made a 52 foot hole outside of this wall. But this hatch here came off and got blew off in the engine room, right under. And it hit my chief commissary steward in the head. And he was running down the passageway, and he wasn't supposed to be there. He's, he ran from his battle station. I read the letter the captain wrote to his wife. I saw it in New York when I went back, and it wasn't very complimentary. You know. mm -hmm. What happened to him? Oh, he was killed instantly. That I had to him in the back of him. They killed him instantly. Mm -hmm. They laid him out on the back from the pan mm -hmm. And this is a repair ship. There's not much to see here, so I won't show that. Here's another picture of that where it hit that suicide plane. Okay. Now, um, now, tell us about. Well, we still have a little thing about this air attack. Okay. I look back behind this uh, here, and I saw two planes coming in from the rear. Okay, show that again. This is. I saw two planes coming in there, and. Uh, these gun mounts back here shot them down. There's two guns back there, one on the port side, one, and they shot them down. They just missed our ship by inches. They just went kind of burned up and went right in. Missed. You'd hit them? Yeah, we had hit the guy, them. The guys in the gun crew at the back of the gun. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see now here. Well, anyway, in the meantime, I looked out over the water and I saw a plane. Uh, that uh, was flying about five feet above the water. They always had one good pilot drill all the rest of them in, and then they'd report back to Japan. And he saw that they were all gone but him. So he decided to make an attack on us. And uh, I won't relate one story here, that they used to cut off a finger or a part of their ear to give to their parents when they won them. They had a little celebration before they went on a suicide mission. And that was part of what they gave to their family. So anyway, I saw him way over there, about five miles away from us. And he was about five feet above the water and skimming along. Pretty soon he turned around and he came back and he made it a run on us from way up. And he saw he was going to miss us. That's when I could hit him with a baseball bat. Uh, he saw he was going to miss us and he pulled out of his dive. Well, he had a green shirt on and yellow lettering on his back. His cockpit wasn't covered over. It was out there. Bear. And uh, so he skimmed over the water and he whirled and turned back. And he came right up over us and he started down. And he'd go this way and that way. When he went this way, he was heading right, right this way and right into my gun mount. The other way, he was on the gun mount on the other side. But he just turned in and he hit the flagpole. I, I had jumped out of the gun mount. I was down in, the guys jumped on top of me. I looked up and I thought, well, this is it. Mm -hmm. this is I said, I really accepted it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, but I couldn't do nothing about it. I couldn't. You figured that this yeah. was the end. Yeah. So when he hit that flagpole and flipped over and went on the other side, he went down in the engine room and killed everybody down here. And the engine room and fire. And uh, so they went, we only had one body that was intact. And we got out three days later. Mm -hmm. We got. To, we got him out and he dropped him down on the deck. It sounded like a chunk of concrete. I could see a big hole in the back and shoulder mm -hmm. in front. Something went right through him. I don't know what piece of metal I suppose was heavy. And uh, so it took three days to pump all the water out. And so when uh, we finally got the water out, we went down and removed the bodies. 
but before that happened, there was, uh, I don't like to tell this, but I'm going to, there was one boy came over on the ship to see his brother from another ship. And he wanted to see him. I said, you don't want to see him. He was down there with bullet right in the head, floating around like this. His arms was out, his eyes was, you know, fixed. Mm -hmm. And the guy went down there to see him, and he, he said, I want to see him. I want to be sure. And he did, and it was terrible. Yeah. Which is now he had. Yes, and I wish he had the beer. Because mm -hmm. I think about it all the time. Yeah, I know. You've mentioned this before, so I know yeah. that about you. So my brother was on a ship, the Irwin, and he was over the side, scraping paint. And the guys that knew our ship was hit, but they wouldn't tell him until they were trying to find out if I was all right. But they couldn't get that message to him. So finally, he told him, he says, uh, Jimmy, you was out here on Danville. Mm -hmm. He was picked up a lot of the Princeton survivors when they got hit. Uh, he said that, uh, he, they said, well, Jimmy, there's your brother's ship or whatever, they got to get home in. So uh, he got a boat to come over to see me. And I was all right, thank God. I didn't have a scratch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I doctored one boy up that had that burn all over his face. Kid from, from Alabama, he had. Mm -hmm. and, doctor said he'd done a good job on him. He wanted to go and see the doctor. And I said, he won't take you now. I said, he's got too many serious casualties down there. He's taking care of When guy got his feet blown off. Sure. And uh, so I got the first aid kit out. Went all over his face real lightly. And I said, I'll leave that all in there till tomorrow and you see the doctor. His name was Chambers from uh, Birmingham. He'd already say, I'm from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was a good kid. And he's only 18 years old, and I'm, I'm about 25 at this time. Mm -hmm. So he ran around with me like I was his father or something. Mm -hmm. I can understand that now. I couldn't then. Mm -hmm. And anyway, he went to the doctor the next day, and the doctor said, well, somebody took good care of you. He, he said, I couldn't have done any better. Mm -hmm. And that's great. So he told him what to do. and. Uh, so he followed his up. He came out all right. He didn't have a scar on him or nothing. I thought he all oh, blistered, you know, mm -hmm. that he would have some bad burns. But uh, you should have been a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but was, uh, was, let's back up just a little bit, Woody. At the moment of impact when that kamikaze hit, was there a loud explosion? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Was there fire? A lot of fire? Uh, I was on the deck and under the gun out, and I couldn't see any fire. There might have been, but I couldn't see it. It was well, shielded from me because yes. of the... Uh, was there a considerable panic and uh, uh, no, turmoil? No, there wasn't. It actually, actually, there wasn't. Everything was calm, and I just said to myself, I wonder why God wants me to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's bad. Yeah, it is bad. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's move on. Uh, after the impact, and you get, uh, you said it took about three days, you pumped water out, got the bodies out. Mm -hmm. uh, then what did you do with your ship? Well, we was right there for a month. See, we was inside, this is a repair ship. And they had us tilted up here next. This is our ship, and that's the repair ship. See, they tilted us up so they could pump the water out. Uh -huh. So they repaired you right where? Right there. Right there. They, they welded a 52-foot hole on us. They couldn't work in the, at nighttime because uh -huh. of the uh, because of the uh, suicide plane to see the full, uh, mm -hmm. welding torches and things. Sure. Uh -huh. So they had to do this all at the not at Were the you able to go to battle stations and shoot at the enemy? No, we, well, were, we were dead. You were dead. In fact, when my brother came over to see me, we had an area air attack. And he said, uh, well, we did. I said, well, they told us to go to our um, bunker room and scatter out all over the ship. Don't stay at your battle station. Go wherever. And so we went down to my uh, bunker room and stood there for a while. And uh, the attack lasted about 15 minutes. I don't know. I couldn't see what all was going on. Okay. And they didn't hit us. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they, uh, he uh, was there while uh, we had this uh, attack, and then after it was over, why he left mm -hmm. and went back.
after his ship. And that's kind of ironic that two brothers would be that close together. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Things like that seem to happen though, mm-hmm. during the war. Um, well, you were there still in the water, mm-hmm. out of commission for about a month. Then what would you do? Well, they sent us back to, uh, to the States to get us repaired. Uh, they welded that plate on us, and then we back. We come back with one engine room and one fire room. We went to Hawaii, and uh, well, we went to Saipan first, and then on to Hawaii. We got supplies in Saipan. Mm-hmm. So when we got to Hawaii, the captain said that anybody who lived uh, west of the Mississippi could go home on leave because we went to Brooklyn Navy Yard and be repaired for the invasion of Japan. And uh, so he, they thought like it'd be about the first of November. That's what mm-hmm. they was estimating. They couldn't come right out and tell you for sure, but that's what they. Mm-hmm. they so they, there weren't very many, hardly anybody from the East Coast wanted off. And this, most of the complement of the ship was from the East Coast. I think they only had two or three guys west of the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. So there was room for more. Mm-hmm. So I went up and signed up to just come home. And got well, when would this be? What date? Well, uh, I'll tell you, we got we, we start we got hit on June the 6th. Okay. And we started back July the 7th. That was a month later. We, they finished this July the 7th. And it took almost up until August, about another one, to get on to the States. Where did you go in the States? I, I went to San Diego and got a plane and came home. Uh, flew home. And that's when, that's the reason why I know that's when the war ended. Right. Because I had come home to see my family, and uh, there weren't very many of us, about eight or nine of us all together. One was an officer mm-hmm. that flew flew east. And I was down to my uncle's to see him. He was sick, mm-hmm. down the way with And he, uh, we was listening to the radio there, and a news bulletin come on about this atomic bomb test, mm-hmm. or atomic bombing at Japan. Mm-hmm. And he asked me, he said, what kind of a bomb is that? I said, I don't know. I've never heard of it. That's how mm-hmm. secret it was. Yes. Nobody knew it except the people that handle it. Mm-hmm. So I said, I don't know. So then they dropped the second one, and then Japan surrendered. I just happened to be home mm-hmm. at that time. Uh, because our ship was out of commission, we couldn't do nothing. So I was supposed to meet my ship in Brooklyn Navy Yard. So when my leave was up, I think I had 10 days, I went back to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and, and signed in. And at that time, the Navy had decided our ship was so badly damaged inside, take a new engine room and fire room and get it back in shape mm-hmm. that it wasn't worth the money. Mm-hmm. So they jumped it. Mm-hmm. And then they reassigned me. And they said, now you can go home, report any place you want to uh, in two weeks. <coughs> so I came home for two more weeks. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. And then I reported at the Indianapolis recruiting station over in Indianapolis. And they sent me to San Francisco for reassignment. And I was out there quite a while. And finally they sent me aboard this hospital ship. Well. I didn't know where it was at, so they, they sent me aboard this ship in, uh, I think it was in San Francisco, yeah, that's where it was. And I went aboard there, and uh, when I went aboard, the, the guy I relieved was just coming off of the ship. He said, you're my replacement? And I said, well, I guess so. And uh, he said, well, I'm leaving. So. He was a pretty mean character. I mean, from all the words I got yeah. from the crew, he was mean. Mm-hmm. And he had no right to be. Mm-hmm. Just because you're lost or equal sign, you have to be That's mean. right. So, anyway, I took his place, and then we went to Japan, and we got over there about the 1st of November, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And I was there till the next May. Mm-hmm. So, I, I went up to the executive officer one day, and I said, Sir, can I ask you a question? Yeah, what do you want? I said, I'd like to go down there to McKinney, that bomb test. I said, I've been out here for the place for so long. I'm tired of it. 
And he said, well, he reached over and tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I'm glad that you want to go because tomorrow we leave for McKinney. Is that he said, with that hospital ship? Mm -hmm. he said, what was the name of that hospital USS ship? USS Bountiful. And uh, he said, uh, we got to go back to the States first and pick up some supplies. And he said, we may have to pick up some billy goats. I don't know. He said, they're talking about everything. <laughs> so we come back to San Francisco and we picked up supplies and organized our trip to, uh, to Virginia, which I had to get supplies, food supplies, because I was chief commissary steward. Mm -hmm. And I had to be sure that we had enough supplies. You were a chief then? Yes, I was a chief. I made chief when I went aboard this hospital ship. Good. And Did uh, you find that to be a little better duty than well, the grades below that? You know, when you get first class, you don't have too much to do. You have a lot of responsibility, but you don't have the work to do. Yeah, I, I, like, I only worked about two hours a day. You had to change uniforms too, didn't you? Yeah, I changed uniforms. In fact, uh, when I was, uh, I hadn't been on there for about a, but about a month when the fly officer called me down and he said, Martin, he said, we need, we, we need a chief aboard here. And he said, you've been awful good to help me. He said, I come aboard here maybe just like you did. And he said, I didn't know anything about the supply part of it. And he said, the man used the thing. He said, you've done a good job. You helped me immensely. And we need a chief. So I'm going to recommend you a chief. He said, i got to give you a test. And all it was was just a test over my duties I had done since cook school. That was great. So I didn't have any problem with that. In fact, uh, before I left that ship, he uh, wanted to give me a warrant officer training. I said, no, I said, I'm, I'm believing in the Navy. I don't want a more officer rating. Which, now I look back and it's kind of stupid. You know? That's been great. Yeah. Okay, you're on a hospital ship and you're heading for where they're having the atomic bomb tests, yes. right? Okay, mm -hmm. tell us about that. Well, they, uh, I think they delayed it one day because of the weather. And uh, so the, uh, we had orders to cover our eyes during the flights when it detonated, uh, which I did. I didn't want to take a chance on losing my eyesight. And we was in close, and they dropped this. We had a, about a three-mile area of old ships left over from the Navy that they wanted to use for testing. This bomb test went off about three seconds too soon, which was about 1,500 feet. They estimated, but my goodness, the damage that it didn't do. It just took an aircraft carrier deck and just rolled it back like he, a can opener would open a can, and uh, so it it did a lot of damage to ships. And we went in and looked it over. Really, that was stupid. Did they drop this atomic bomb to a plane? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you see the bomb coming down? No, we weren't allowed to watch it. You couldn't have seen it, I don't think, anyway, the speed that it came down. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could have seen it. Um, how many miles away were you from where the bomb was dropped? I think we were about, to, I think maybe about 15 miles. And that's what you can see on the horizon, if you're three feet above mm -hmm. the water, the horizon will be about 15 miles away. And uh, that's like in your backyard, you know. Mm -hmm. Did you have any protective clothing on? No, I just wore regular uniforms. And you had your eyes covered. They told us to cover our eyes until mm -hmm. they gave the word their detonation. What happened when it went off? Oh, it was an awful explosion. And uh, I looked up and I saw that, I saw this mushroom cloud they, they talk about. Mm -hmm. just, just right now it was up in the air about, oh, 70,000 feet. Just mm -hmm. in three seconds. It just went up. And it just looked like fire. I mean, like it was a pink cloud. Did you feel anything there? You your... couldn't feel anything. You, you know? didn't feel any heat? No. 15 miles out or, or any wind? Any... I didn't. I didn't because I was on the opposite side of the ship from where they detonated it. And uh, I just, I looked up and I saw that cloud going up in the air just as fast as it could go. It'd have to be 
atomic bomb to go off to, to go that high that from yeah. now. <laughs> Three seconds, 70,000 feet. Mm -hmm. That's moving. Yes, it is. And then uh, on top of that, it was a uh, the cloud like a big pink cotton ball, like you'd see at the carnival. You'd see these pink yeah. mm -hmm. candy. candy. Sure. That's the way the cloud looked, the color. And uh, I, we didn't know what was going to happen. We did not know. And you just took your chances like you did during the war. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I wasn't afraid of that one as the underwater test that they had. Tell us about that. Well, they had, uh, they, the USS Cumberland set off by radio on the underwater test they had. They put a atomic bomb over the surface of the water. I don't know how far down. And the USS Cumberland set it off by radio. Well, it just shot up there. You never saw such an, an explosion of water raising in the air. I mean, it was for, looked like a mile and a half across up in the air, and you could see that ships floating around up in there. Look, it was little chips <laughs> in the water. And that was uh, quite a, it kind of scared me, because when that water came down, there was a tremendous wave come right at us, and about four or five feet high, and we turned into, the, into it. And, you know, I used to be concerned maybe about radioactivity mm -hmm. breaking it up there, and I know it had to be there. It's never affected me. I mean, I don't think. Did you have any protective eyes no, for that? No, you we didn't, didn't have. No, okay. but the underwater test was, to me, was the most uh, exciting part, as far as the testing of it is concerned. Mm -hmm. And I knew then that ships could never, never travel close together, you know, like they should. Mm -hmm. If there's an atomic bomb going to be dropped on, like they had all that mud. Ships over there in the desert, storm in there in the Gulf. Uh, you can't operate that way against atomic bombs. No, no. And I don't know why they ever expect to. They can't. No. But they, uh, there was uh, quite a, an experience to me. And then they stirred up all the sharks in the in the Pacific. I think they were swimming around the ship for, for days. Uh, were there dead fish too? I didn't see too many dead ones, but I saw an awful lot of sharks swimming near the ship. Why, I don't know, but they did. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that went on that I don't know the answer to. But the, the thing that got me was all those sailors and crews that went in there to test those goats and animals they had and tested, you know. But I know for sure. One thing for sure, this world cannot use atomic weapons against each other. It's just madness mm -hmm. after seeing that. Mm -hmm. it just, it's just madness if they ever try. Yeah. It'll destruct oh, the whole yeah. universe, right? Or the whole Earth. Yeah. Civilization will be gone. Yeah. Well, what did you do after the atomic bomb test then, Woody? Well, they, they brought us back to. Uh, San Francisco, no, Seattle. We rose back to Seattle. And we went there. We was there for about a week. And they finally took me off that ship. They decided they was going to destroy that ship to put it out of commission. Mm -hmm. They took all the crew off. They sent me down to San Francisco. And they reassigned me to the USS Law. I wasn't even commissioned yet. The USS Law is at the destroyer. I laid around there for several weeks, and finally, uh, they they said they was going to go shake down cruise the Pacific. Well, I had all that I wanted, so I said they had an all map 545. I believe it was coming out from the Navy that if you had four years of service of certain rates that you could apply to get out. Well, I had about six years at that time. Anyway, <laughs> I went over and signed up. Told them, well, they tried to get me to join the reserves, and I said, no, I want out, period. And I don't want to go back to the Pacific on another ship down cruise. Well, I wound up that ship. I read the paper when I got home after I was discharged. They went to the Mediterranean. I wish they'd have stayed on. If I'd have known that, I would have. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, 
I came home then, and uh, I, I, I waited about three months to get my discharge, and I kept waiting. And they always put a list of names out. And I'd go over and watch the list every day, and my name wasn't on it. So probably I went over to the office one day, and I told them, I said, I want to know why I can't find give me a discharge. I've been waiting three months. And the guy over there, she said, well, let me look and see if i got your records here. So he looked through a bunch of files, and finally he found them. He said, boy, he said, these records have been here for a long time. He said, why? I don't know. He said, I have nothing to do with posting discharges. And he said, you can be here forever. And I said, I don't want to be here forever. I want to go home. So finally he posted my name, and I was gone in three days. And, and you came home? I came home. You were discharged where? In uh, San Francisco. I see. And then you came back to Montgomery County? Yeah, I went down the way from my brother lived there, and I wasn't married. Then what did you do? Well, I kind of, my dad saw me a lot south of town. I came home and worked with him for a while. And I wanted to go into the uh, lumber business and hardware business and get a loan. You know, I mean, he wouldn't, didn't want to work with me. He said he was obligated to his nephews. Yeah. Than they, uh, saw me Somewhere along the line here, did you get married? Yeah, I married uh, my wife. Uh, What's her name? Jo What's her name? Joanne, Joanne uh, Carter, mm -hmm. and uh, I met her through her her mother. Her mother was a dispatcher down at the yellow cab office, mm -hmm. and she came in one day, and then she worked at the uh, ice cream place down on South Washington Street, mm -hmm. and uh, I met her. So we got married. Did you have any children? Yeah, I had two children. One. Lives here in Crawford's Rail, and one in Carmel. Do you have any grandchildren? I have four granddaughters. And I have a I had a stepdaughter and a step grandson. They're in Florida. And they've been down there over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So. What do you do now? I'm retired. I worked for Alcoa for almost 30 years. In uh, Lafayette. Yeah. And I did live up there for a while, but uh, the kids want me to come back down here. Be with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, at this time we'll pause for a moment. Woody, uh, let's go back to, uh, to the occupation of Japan uh, when you uh, went into Tokyo Bay. Uh, tell us what happened there during the occupation. Well, we went in there to uh, the, the hospital ship went in there to service the fleet, the sicknesses or whatever, you know, and. So we was there from, I think, early November till the next May, till we got ready to go to Bikini. Anyway, <clears throat> I saw a terrible amount of poverty and people just running around with no place to sleep and no jobs and so many, so many children were dying and they was carrying them down the alleyways with flies blowing on them. They didn't have a, any good restaurants because it was all done away with. But uh, you'd see maybe some guy would take some old poles and make a three-sided place to, for people to go in and eat. And then he'd have a big old barrel with the side and he'd cook fish, rice, and everything right in the same barrel and turnips. And that was, you know, that was good eating for those people which they didn't have much in the first place. And I saw a lot of poverty, a lot of bomb destruction. Tokyo was badly, badly damaged. And Wall Street, you couldn't get down yet, you know, buildings over in the streets. Uh, I think it was Kobe that was badly damaged too, if I remember right. And uh, Yokosuka, Yokosuka we call it, but they call it Yokosuka, wasn't too bad, I didn't think. They had a good officer club there, a place for the chiefs and the officers to go and drink, mm -hmm. had a few beers. I did talk to one guy, I said he was a kamikaze pilot, but I doubt it. The reason I doubted it was that uh, he just wanted to make me feel good, I guess. His age, mm -hmm. they didn't have kamikaze pilots that young, or that old. Mm -hmm. They just didn't, and he was, 
I figured it was too old to be a Kamikaze pilot. Did you go to downtown Yokohama? Mm -hmm. Yeah, destruction between Yokosuka and Yokohama. There was quite a lot of destruction there. Oh yeah, there. yeah, yeah. The roads was, yeah, there were uh, a lot of buildings bombed uh, terribly. Yeah. Uh, it's just a case of when you have a war and you're bombed, and you're just going to have a lot of destruction, a lot of deaths, and it wasn't pleasant. You know, I'm glad it was their cities instead of ours. Yeah. Did you uh, run across any famous people while you were there? Any what? Famous people. Oh, well, I didn't run across them. I about ran over one, Hirohiro. We was over to Tokyo one day. We was coming back with uh, the Yokosuka, and they were having a tour of the Imperial Palace. The whole crew of people, nine cars they had, limousines, and they had the Imperial Palace on it. And I wasn't driving, my buddy was a driver. And we went and started across the street, and Imperial Palace came right in front of us. We almost hit him. And like I say, he, uh, he, 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 he never budged, he just sat real still, but his eye, he turned his eyes, he never turned his head, just his eyes, and looked at us. They went right on. And we come, but then that far, crashing into him. We just hopped right up against him. And that was the only famous people I met. I used to see a lot of people, talk to them, find out their opinions about the war, and they didn't like Tojo. Mm -hmm. They hated him. Not like we'd hate some of our generals that got us into the war. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to them. They didn't want that war. And I felt sorry for them. I felt sorry for the kids. And I used to take a gum and candy in my pockets. I wasn't supposed to. I was jeopardized in my career by doing it. And uh, I'd take it out and I'd get out to the gate and then they'd see me coming. They knew me. Gum Joe, they'd say, Gum Joe. I'd get the candy out, throw it up in the air. <laughs> they was glad to see me, but I always took plenty for everybody. I, I enjoyed that part of it. I never really associated with the Japanese people themselves too much, except, well, they were so disorganized. They really were. And they didn't have anything. No jobs, no food, nothing. Just mercy. I used to go, oh, there was an army base over there, a company of army personnel. They had about 100 men in it, I think. And they come out at noon to scrape their, their trays. And then Japs used to jump up, knock the trays out of their hand, and scrape what food they could get. And that was, that was sad. Yes. Well, Woody, this has been a very interesting uh, interview. Uh, this time, I want to thank you for what you did for America during the World War II, and uh, wish you well. And thanks so much for giving us this interview. Thank you. Thank you. Man. You're welcome.